In this session, two papers are scheduled to be presented. The first one on a comparative study of education, social and religious thoughts of Swamiji and Mahasmala by Professor Ratna Koshi. And then Roma Rola and Swami Vivekananda the quest for a new space by Professor Jenny Maiko. May I request Professor Ratna Koshi to be present. At the very outset, I extend my heartfelt thanks and reverence to the organizers of Ramakrishna Mission Institute of Culture and also the Kulabhaktar Institute. ICPR, who have given me the chance to share the days with his honorable and very learned scholars, among whom I am a very, not only a pygmy, but also among the pygmy, a very small one. However, when I have been given the task, I took it as a task and tried my level best to prepare myself and collect some materials from the works of Swami Vivekananda, collected works of Swami Vivekananda in different volumes, and also the literature on Swami Vivekananda covering different aspects of his life and teaching. Now, let us recollect, I have been given the topic, the comparative study of education social and religious thoughts of Swamiji and Max Mula. First I begin with Swamiji's ideas and I bring, try to bring out in a nutshell what education uh, was to Swami Vivekananda and how these three aspects, principles or philosophy of education and social and religious thoughts are not exclusive of each other but they form one complete whole uh, for Swami Vivekananda. Let us recollect some of the utterances of Swami Vivekananda on the subject. I quote and all our quotations. Education is the manifestation of the perfection already in man. Religion is the manifestation of the divinity already in man. Religion is the manifestation of the natural strength that is in man. Religion is not in books nor in theories, nor in dogmas, nor in talking, nor even in reasoning. It is being and becoming. Realization is real religion. All the rest is only preparation. Religion is not in doctrines, in dogmas, nor in intellectual arguments. It is realization. All religions are true. Court ends. And I, although not asked for, I give footnote here to the utterance of Swami Vivekananda. Already in man, divinity already in man, natural strength that is in man. So here man is not exclusive of woman. Naturally, Swami Vivekananda included woman also in this. Man is mortal. And, uh, no. <laughs> and when, sorry for my bad throat. And if, had it been not so, if it were not so, he would not give so much importance on women's education. And he had delivered lectures and answered questions in occasions of different dialogues with different personalities inside India and abroad on women's education in the context of improving the situation of or social situation of women. Now Swami Vivekananda believed 
in the words of his quote unquote master, that is Sri Ramakrishna, that the religions of the world are only various phases of one eternal religion. I underline this word, eternal religion, because Swami Vivekananda always emphasized on this existence of the eternal religion, which gets manifest through different performances and activities and through certain uh, texts and or dogmas or shastras of the particular type, of the particular religion. He defined religion as God, as infinite strength and as infinite strength. In his consideration, religious life is the quote-unquote center and quote-unquote keynote of the national life of India. It is even the quote-unquote backbone and quote-unquote foundation as well. For Swami Vivekananda, religion is not a means but is realization. He did not accept the view that the religious faiths divide men and reason unites them. As if there is a contradiction or conflict between religious faith and reason or as if there must necessarily be a contradiction or a conflict between the religious faith and reasoning because for him it is not religion if it is not rational. Again, he considered that the first taste of true teaching must be that the teaching should not contradict reason. This being the thought structure of religion, education, preaching, teaching, and modes and methods of these as well as the goal of them should not by any means contradict each other, rather those should supplement. Deep mental concentration and sincere perseverance, purity of mind, truthfulness, unselfishness would lead one to the manifestation of perfection and divinity already existing within oneself. Since all beings are manifestations of the Supreme Being, of God, of the highest divinity, each individual, man in Swamiji's idiom, is destined to become divine by realizing the divine. Education contributes towards this process by imparting and acquiring knowledge. Knowledge exists within. The teacher awakens it in the thought. Here comes the question of pedagogy as advised by Swami Vivekananda. The leading note of Vivekananda regarding proper education was that it should be man-making education and also naturally nation-making. Later on in certain other articles we explain if the individual in his own man is not educated or enlightened, the society cannot be enlightened or educated. If the man doesn't have faith in himself, in his own self, then how can the society have faith in its own existence and, and its nature? And naturally, if it is if it is devoid of this faith and strength or faith in its own strength, that society cannot progress far to speak of its prospering. Mere assimilation and storing of some material facts and figures related to events and mundane affairs did not mean education. He advocated for such man-making education all round when he said education, education and education all round. What India needs is education. Knowledge is to be brought from within, the instruments of which are instinct, reason and inspiration. The real human life consists of knowledge. Knowledge brings strength and freedom. Knowledge makes one perfect. Knowledge can be attained through the unique method called concentration. He has written 
several paragraphs on this primary condition or primary state of education has concentration on concentration. I don't go into the details of the quotations. He insisted on meditation, calmness of mind, and not collecting facts and reproducing them in the name of education. He emphasized that the power of concentration leads to the treasure house of knowledge. This is the path of Raja Yoga in his words. The very essence of education is concentration of mind. The goal is to develop Godward passion and manward love. This explains how and why Swami Vivekananda not only advocated for mass education, women's education, special or technical education, etc., but he chalked out the guidelines for translating the ideas and principles uttered by him into action. Subjects like pedagogy, methodology and teacher's training have also been discussed at length, exposing the ground realities of Indian society in minute details and objective analysis to convince others. The inspiration for Karma Yoga was announced. I come to Frederick Masmula next. But before that, I ponder upon Swami Vivekananda's philosophy of education a little more. What is the predominant note of Swami Vivekananda's teaching? The question does not seem to have been answered as yet. Sister Nivedita, however, admirably sums them all up in our concept of the twofold purpose of nation making and world moving of Vivekananda's life's mission. Admitting the mission to be a Vedantic mission, the twofold purpose of Sister Nivedita's conception becomes a sufficient indicator of the pivotal note of Swamiji's life and teachings. And it is nothing but realization of goodness, of perfection, of the divinity in man. From the philosophical standpoint in general, this may be regarded as a creed of infinite growth as opposed to determinism of man-God's most beloved creature. By the term growth of man is meant growth of his soul in search of truth and goodness. So two things are dominant in the writings of Swami Vivekananda when he speaks of education and religion, that is the search of truth. And later he speaks when he talks on science and religion and education and science and teaching of science or giving te imparting technical education. He stresses on the point that all is in search of truth and truth is one. But the term growth of men is meant growth of his soul in search of truth and goodness. This concept of growth or more accurately of realization is the key to Swami Vivekananda's social and political philosophy. And the concept is not merely a derivation from but also a molder of his Vedanta. I leave out certain portions, the objections, etc., etc. The purpose of human life is to realize the divine in him, the divine within. And to this end, man, to the exclusion of other animals, has been endowed with the power of contemplation, of experiencing and experimenting with truth. According to Sri Ramakrishna, the individual is a relatively free being, God or Divine Mother has endowed him with a sense of freedom of action. This volitional nature enabled him to become a metaphysical creature, so to see and thereby realize his real or divine nature. Swami Vivekananda quotes the matter thus, quote, it is religion, inquiry into the Animal man is the only animal that looks upwards. 
every other animal naturally looks down. That looking upward and going upward and seeking perfection are what is called salvation. Quot ends. Again, quotation begins, man, according to the Vedanta philosophy, is the greatest being that is in the universe, etc., etc. Unity in variety is knowledge. Its antipode is avidya. So we have to remove this avidya and how to reason this he has elaborated. And at one place he says, the same is for when we, it is talked about religion. It is not religion if it is devoid of reason because both education or knowledge or religion, they are or science, they are searching for the truth, the basic truth, the existing truth and also the final and eternal truth. And how can one proceed, how can man proceed from the intelligent existence of human being? The human progress cannot be called progress if it is not with reason. Science and religion form a basic social feature of our life today. The civilization in which we live today is the product of the discipline of human mind called science. The two aspects of this discipline called science are namely pure science and uh, pure science which understands the truth of experience through an objective and dispassionate inquiry. And the other one is called applied science in which the truth discovered by pure science develops into technical enrichment of human life. Science explains their reality appearing before human view, but does not deal with their reality behind the world around. The outer world is scanned, analyzed, explained by the science. But the unobservable universe behind the observable is not revealed in that method. Many scientists of both pure and applied pursuits still consider the nature and the cosmos to be basically or profoundly quote unquote mysterious or shrouded with such features of which science could only scratch the outer layer. Man in the nature and universe is another mystery. Man has created science, technology, culture and civilization. Man only is a possible destroyer of all these even. Everything about the creature of human beings is a mystery. Lincoln Barnett says, as quoted by Swami Ramanatha Nanda, Swami, the, the title is a monograph, Swami Vivekananda, a universe of symphony. Man is thus his own greatest mystery. He comprehends but little of his organic processes and even less of his unique capacity to perceive the world around him, to reason and to dream. Least of all does he understand his noblest and most mysterious faculty, the ability to transcend himself and perceive himself in the act of perception. Quote ends. Here starts the meeting point of science and religion. In other words, the scientific basis of religion because religion which for Swamiji is basically Vedanta takes up the investigation into the mystery of human experience where the positive sciences end up. Vivekananda upholds both religion and science as valid disciplines in the pursuit of truth. There is no contradiction. Both have risen as the primary instrument in their pursuit. Religion is not dogma or certain conspicuous rituals only. The methods of investigation in the field of religion is largely quite similar to that followed in the case of positive sciences. They are namely collection of facts, classifying those, an objective dispassionate and neutral study of those, and finally, application of such knowledge acquired for the removal of human suffering 
non-knowledge, ignorance, human ignorance, and for the enrichment as well as progress of human life and civilization. Swami Vivekananda has repeatedly emphasized on the point that Vedanta and modern science are close to each other in spirit, temporal and objective. Reasoning being their ground stone, reasoning being their ground stone, the search for the relation of cause and effect is specific for both, for both science and Vedanta. The difference lies in the fact that which for the modern scientist is a structure of materiality or material stuff forming the background, Vivekananda is convinced that it is not lifeless stuff but conscious, eternal, spiritual truth, the source, the cause and the ultimate reality of all existence. The utility of science is to bring out the perfect man. Spiritual knowledge convinces man of eternal and infinite strength, fearlessness, bliss and happiness. To sum up, I quote Swami Ramanathananda, the previous work, page 192F, quotation begins, Vedanta expounded by Vivekananda as the synthesis of science and religion is also the synthesis of hidden art, of the classical and the romantic in the human heritage. The astral tendency, the astral tendency in modern education to treat the humanities and the sciences as mutually exclusive disciplines is giving place to Vedantic awareness that they are complementary to each other. Vivekananda has bequeathed to man in a moving passage his vision of the unity and synthesis of all human energy and aspiration. Vivekananda said, I quote, 1, 4, page 4, 37, 13, edition. Infinite perfection is in every man, though unmanifested. Every man has in him the potentiality of attaining to perfect saintliness, Rishikut, or to the most exalted position of an avatar, or to the greatness of a hero in material discoveries. It is only a question of time and adequate, well-guided investigation, etc to have this perfection manifested. <coughs> Swami Vivekananda's progressive, liberal and above all compassionate mindset provoked him to initiate an all-out endeavor for mass education. For, the, for he considered lack of education was the root cause of all their sufferings and miseries. Head and heart, a committed communist like Hiren Mukherjee admits that, quotation begins, here indeed one hears the voice of revolution of the confidence of Vivekananda in the power of true religion to grip the masses and become no longer a theory of the universe but a practical force. It is here that communism for all its faults and failures, the only ecumenical challenge to religion finds in Vivekananda's thought points of affinity as well as of difference. Now on mass education, Swami Vivekananda, this is I quote, says, spreading education among the masses, if we are to rise again, you see, talks of the ancient days, we shall have to do it in the same way. That is by spreading education among the masses. Through education comes faith in one's own self. And through faith in one's own self, the inner Brahman is waking up in them. And if the poor people cannot come to the place of education, the education is the teachers have to walk door to door to the poor people. So in those days, before more than 100 years, he envisaged this feature of mass education with which the till date our both the central or the state governments are at difficulties to have real demonstration and to reach the perfection of it or even they reach the benchmark set by its own principles and committees. He says, I quote, 
The poor, the children of the poor people cannot come to school, even if you give free education to them, because they are so poor that they have to earn their livelihood from even at their childhood. So you have to go door to door, like the Pariprajakas of the old days. They used to go for bhiksha, but now you will go and give them bhiksha. And this is the way the mass education can take a shape. For women, he says, that women should be made, they should get, acquire independence. So I emphasize this and underline this word independence. The women's education, etc., or many words are said. The why women's education? Why women should be educated the same way? They should get their independence. And he said, I quote again, if they get independence, they can decide for themselves what is good for them and what is not. This was in the context of this age of consent and widow remarriage, etc., etc. But even if we take it out of that context, this remains. A headline beyond time and space that through education women should have, should acquire the desire, independence to, to take decision on matters they like and about themselves also, on matters related to themselves. So this being the purpose of education, be it for the poor and be it for women. So he talked on women's education separately. And this was without violating or deviating from, from the standards set by the ancient scriptures. One way he was criticizing, he was actually endocritic, so to say, as an endologist. He criticized the existing system and the situation all around. And again, he took resort to the teaching of the solution, of the methods of solu reaching solution to solve the problems. He resorted to the ancient scriptures, but with a new light on them. What the women require for the purpose is woman-making education, which can build up a strong character and sense of independence in them. He therefore prescribed for them religious scriptures, literature, even Sanskrit grammar and English language. As principle of education also and contents and curriculum of education, this was also in Vivekananda's formulation that they should, there should be Sanskrit teaching, the Vedanta, Upanishads, and at the same time European language, particularly English. There should be philosophy and ritual, at the same time science, and so, and reasoning, and and regional languages of India, they should also be included and they should have a very prominent position in the curricula all over India. This was the point where Friedrich Maxwell and Vivekananda talked in the same tone, thought in the same way in contrast to the principles formulated by the then British government. A well-ordered home requires something in addition, this is even women's education. Thus he added to the list of such subjects, also cooking and sewing and domestic science, etc., etc. It is not to show the women as only homemakers that he prescribed this also in the curriculum of women education. Maybe today a person like me, a very frivolous person with a naughty mind would say this culinary art and swimming and domestic science and upbringing of children, the lessons on these subjects may also be included in the education and the curriculum of men or boys as well. Anyway, that apart, that is like But what is to be noted here that even in those days when women were chiefly homemakers only to talk into this dark, there was no real teaching of domestic science and children's education, how to bring up their children properly. Even that was not, though that teaching was not imparted to women. So that was the social need. Even if women are kept as in, within home, 
with, when, and they are kept for only looking after the kitchen and their children. So that also requires some level of education and reasoning and common sense, etc. And that personality building, that personality building is not possible without education. And nowadays we know home science, nutrition, child care, child psychology, all these are very important parts. And those who are expecting children, though the baby care people, they send the parents, the couples, to sessions of these, uh, where these lectures on these subjects are imparted. I conclude, and you are almost up. At another place, Vivekananda says, that society is the greatest where the highest truth becomes practical. If we just memorize the truth and repeat them, that is no education at all. He says, ignorance is the root of all sufferings, all evils, even sins. Unity in variety is knowledge, which can remove the veil of ignorance. Swami Vivekananda recognized the material world not only as illusion, maya, but as quote-unquote real. The worldly miseries, sufferings are real problems, not only illusion. And evils which are to be removed by rendering service to mankind with genuine, selfless, unselfish love and compassion. Only the detached mind properly trained in discipline is capable of doing that. Thus, work is to be performed, but that is to be done with the mind that, with the mind of a karma yogi, without any sense of selfish position and craving for personal gain. Vivekananda's religious philosophical and social realization is that this world confronted by us is a real one, of course, of a secondary reality. He strongly engaged himself in the all-out removal of all types of human miseries. The universal religion and not international religion was his motto. The practice of such a religion within the frames or paths of different religious heritages can lead the world of struggle, confrontation and violence to harmony and peace. The religion of humanity. Practical Vedanta is the application of human values in life, in developing godness, divinity, truthfulness, selfless service and non-dualism in the existence in, in the in human existence and nature. Swamiji vows to make religion a social force. His idea is first of at all, first of all, to bring out the gems of spirituality that are stored up in the books and are in possession of a few only. He wanted to have mass education and general education spread all over at different levels so that this store of knowledge stored in some books are known and interpreted by a wider range of people. He wanted to make them popular by bringing them out and make them the common property of all, of every Indian. That way he propagated the teaching of the Shastras of Sanskrit language in the language of the people. Swami Vivekananda's idea of womanhood and when he talked about women's education expressed a unique amalgamation of the past, the present and the future the East and the West, of strength with sweetness, fire with the calm. 
And here we talk about he eulogized Sita and he helped Sita of Valmiki Ramayana with very high esteem. At one place, I quote volume 6 on a brief note on um, the Ramayana. He says, Sita is a unique character. He is so calm and so quiet. She is so strong. She endures and takes up all injuries done, all harm done to her. But she never gives back injury to anybody. She is steady and be Sita. So this was repeated by Sister Nivedita when she visited the Babaja school, girl school. And when she asked the girls, small girls of the school, what, who is the queen of your country? The girls said, Queen Victoria, all the girls. And Sister Nivedita said, then, and how, what a wonder, you don't know the name of your own queen, you don't know the name of Sita. And they said, Sita is Sita, how can she be our queen? So the ego is here, that you are going to help Sita with very high esteem. Now what Vivekananda wanted, Vivekananda understood that most scientists today, as I quote Swami Ramanathananda, most scientists agree today that science alone cannot ensure human happiness. Ramanathananda Swamiji further continues, it can only create conditions for his happiness, but it cannot ensure that man shall be happy or man shall be really fulfilled. That is not the function of science as understood in the positive sciences of physics, biology, etc. It is the province of another discipline, the science of the inner nature of man. So when Swamiji proposed the, the inclusion of lessons of science and technical science in the curriculum, he meant both the science of the material world and also the science of the inner nature of man which is normally called spirituality. But that spirituality should not be misunderstood that that was without prison and it was only bhakti of a very emotional type. He tried to input, put in the logic of why such bhakti should be propagated. Now the science of the, that is the province of another discipline, the science of the inner nature of man, which is the true meaning of religion as understood in Indian thought quotation ends. Please allow me something means because of my voice and uh, the as the Vidati. Friedrich Max Muller in his long 1823 to 1900 and checkered career as an extraordinary scholar met Swami Vivekananda, Swami Vivekananda the great Vedantic scholar, saint, and humanist patriot. Max Muller tried to understand India through all his scholarly activities involved with Indian religion, languages, philosophies, cultural features of India. The main three directions of European views of India during the late 18th and 19th century were more or less of three types, Indophilic, Indocritic, and Indo-Critic field. The Romanticists of Germany were Indo-Philic. And Max Muller was very critical about these Romanticists who were just overwhelmed with Indian literature, Shakuntala, etc. Max Muller's Indological works and views may be categorized as forming the third time Indo-Critic field. He wanted to do good to the Indian public even, and not only appreciate India's past, even though he was close to German Romanticism, Max Muller shared two major points with Vivekananda regarding the importance of Sanskrit for promoting education in India. On the one hand, the social and humanist attitude towards the poor masses of India and constantly thinking over means and methods to improve their conditions through education as well as social recognition on the other. On these two points, Vivekananda and Max Muller totally agree. Both of these great personalities were realistic, but not materialistic. Their great minds felt and realized the universality of truth, pursued in search of it. 
curriculum and methods of teaching form an important part of Max Muller's endeavors also, which is quite different from his monumental tasks of bringing out the series of sacred books of the East, critical edition of the Rig Veda, with science as commentary, writings on the science of language, and so on and so forth. The great linguist and philologist Friedrich Max Muller advocated that Sanskrit and Indian languages as well should be promoted for the betterment of the quality of education in India and even in the face of displeasure of the then British rulers of colonial India, con Max Muller continued to campaign for Sanskrit and the Sanskrit rooted languages. Same were the views of Vivekananda with regard to contents of education which included Sanskrit and Western languages, Vedanta and modern science, spiritual lessons and technical education. Swami Vivekananda paid special attention in his writings to the views of Max Muller on the Vedas. Vedic people's pursuit of the truth of knowledge and rightness of conduct attracted and engrossed both Max Muller and Vivekananda. This equipped their conversation when they met in England. Both Max Muller and Vivekananda introduced new worlds of thinking and knowledge systems which were not in existence before. In search of truth and scientific truth, they relied upon